Perfect. So hi, I'm Marita with uh, Vocal Europe, and today we are going to be looking at the region of the Western Balkans, its relation with the EU, and how it has changed since the crisis in Ukraine, focusing on depicting its fragility. We are honoured to be joined here today by Igor Bandovich and to get his distinguished take on the matter. So thank you for joining us today. You're welcome. You come from a background of international law and international relations, also with a history in engaging in civil society movements. You have previously worked for the Belgrade Centre for Human Rights, the IOM, and the UN Development Programme. You also have experience working with the EU as Senior Programme Manager of the European Fund for the Balkans. And since November 2019, you are the Director of the Belgrade Centre for Security Policy. So for our first question, we're going to look at how the Western Balkans have been contenders for the EU membership for some time now. However, the progress has been slow and to some extent stagnated. In your opinion, how do you think the EU accession process has developed? And do you think the unanimous consent set out in the Copenhagen criteria makes membership attainable? Yes, thank you for that question. Yes, I think overall in recent years, the region has been stumbling um, and not really finding the right way how to approach the European integration. On one hand side, on the other hand side, EU has since the Thessaloniki summit in 2003, although promised the future for the region, have not managed to really put it on the track, um, successful and efficient track towards the EU integration process. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that, I think. And I will, I will mention just a few. The EU has, in the last 10 uh, years, gone through migration crisis, the financial crisis, uh, and uh, did, didn't manage to really be, I would say, the force of change in the Balkans because it had um, needed to deal with its own internal, uh, in, internal matters. However, the region... Um, was there and it was looking for the guidance. And at one point in time, I think that gui guidance was limited and was basically uh, just um, narrowed down to the um, verbal uh, rather than um, concrete actions. Um, in the meantime, uh, global world changed and uh, what we have witnessed is that China entered the, the world stage and actually in a way, um, incidentally or not, it entered the stage in Europe through the Balkans. Um, also, Russia managed to then um, find a way to uh, be a um, uh, again, or still um, a force which could prevent, which could influence, and which could somehow, um, um, let's say, spoil the, the process of European integration. That happened in many countries in the region. I can mention a few of them. That's uh, Macedonia, something we call now North Macedonia, Montenegro, Bosnia, and, um, and dominantly Serbia. Um, after, after that, I think, and when the milk was already spilled, I think the EU um, uh, aware of, of the fact that we have now multipolar scene and multipolar uh, powers in, in, in the region was trying <coughs> Uh, somehow to, to uh, let's say, regain the power. But unfortunately, uh, it, um, it, it couldn't deal uh, with, um, first of all, cheap Chinese loans, and secondly, with the, with the legacy of the wars of Yugoslavia. And when I say this, I mean primarily the conflict or a frozen conflict between Kosovo and Serbia, because both countries, especially Russia, has its leverage over, especially Serbia, when it comes to the Kosovo independence. Um, 
I think this this uh, picture was uh, pretty much there when we uh, saw the war in Ukraine started. Uh, just to add to that, that um, uh, in the recent years, U.S. in a way gave um, its uh, I mean gave pivotal role to the EU and was not really um, uh, in a way leading. Uh, the region, uh, but actually left it to to the EU to lead the, the process. Uh, as a as a result, uh, or as a consequence of that, what we had in the last ten years is something uh, that is popular, popular popularly called stabilitocracy, where actually EU leaders wanted to have a relatively tr- uh, relatively um, uh, clear and uh, stable communication channels with the leaders of the region. And basically, um, uh, stabilitocracy was something that marked this phase of the process. That's a very nice way to put and update everyone on the situation. Some good phrases used. And so our next question is, since the conflict in Ukraine, countries such as Kosovo and Bosnia have expressed the urgency to join NATO as a member. In this present moment, how do you think the EU membership compares to NATO's and why would heads of states in the region feel more of an urgency to trace the NATO membership route? I think that's... um... That's in a way natural uh, because I think um, geopolitically speaking, um, EU was uh, basically trying to uh, do something, but it didn't provide basic um, essential uh, security needs of the region. And when people and leaders of the region saw what can happen, to those who are, you know, um, in a way seeking EU membership or seeking further Euro-Atlantic uh, integration, that ca- they can be, um, in a way, put in a position where they are uh, practically left and uh, third power influence or third power, um, uh, let's say, uh, involvement, engagement can put their um, prospects to, to, to risk, to say the least. Um, furthermore, um, without the perspective of the, of the EU integration, at least not a tangible one, EU integration process, uh, uh, in a way, it doesn't provide uh, necessary conditions for the people in the region to feel safe. That is why I think these requests came in the moment where uh, we have uh, seen uh, that the Russia aggression and invasion of Ukraine, uh, in a way, um, um, it, 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 it's a clear uh, proof of how, how fragile the security architecture is. Uh, in, in Europe, which we have not really, I mean, I guess people were surprised and everyone was surprised by that. So in the region, um, these countries are uh, trying to make the case for themselves. They don't want to be uh, another Ukraine. Uh, They want to do that because they feel that the uh, the, the relationship between the countries in the region are in a way um, stuck with the tendency of backsliding. So uh, we don't have a good relationship. Um, I'm speaking from the perspective of Serbia with uh, Kosovo. With the Croatia, the, there is a troublesome relationship. Basically, the both countries are, um, in a way, arm, uh, you know, going into the arm race and uh, saber light, you know, rattling towards each other. Um, and that's not, uh, first of all, how we imagine that this, because this should be European region. And secondly, this is not where we, um, uh, how we basically build um, good neighborly re- relationship in the region. 
So all in all, um, they wanted to, uh, you know, to take advantage of the fact that the Ukraine was attacked in order to make their case. And they want to make their case because stability of the region is uh, fragile. fragile. Perfect. I think it's a good mention of the democratic backsliding. Um, So also sticking to the current crisis, my next question on it would be, the pro-Russian sentiment has become apparent in the region. Um, Some media outlets and political groups in the region expressed their support. And considering this, was there an awareness of pro-Russian sentiment before the crisis hit? And if so, have these sentiments gained in confidence since Russia's advancement in Ukraine? Uh, basically, I think that the region is, is the victim, uh, one of the first victim of disinformation and misinformation campaign. And it has been since probably, I mean, o- almost 10 years, uh, what we are witnessing, especially in Serbia, which is probably the hub for this misinformation, disinformation, fake news uh, strategies, is that uh, almost 90% of the pro-government tabloids are basically using that to show that EU doesn't have the credibility, uh, to show that Russia is present, that there is an alternative power uh, which is trying to um, gain influence in the region, and that's China. And this is incited and inspired very much by the... um, the way how the the leadership in Serbia wanted to send messages towards the EU. And in the nutshell, that message is, if you don't accept us, we will join someone else. And I think that blackmail, um, that blackmail um, was unfortunately working for the EU. And I think they, they were trying to grab the attention of the Serbian leadership by being too soft, too, um, too under, under, understanding, if you want, while in the meantime, the public was getting this uh, um, either fake news uh, or pro-Russian uh, uh, approaches, pro-Chinese approaches. And this is, this is where we are now. I mean, public, public opinion is not set in stone and, and the sh- you can shape and change the public opinion, but it takes time and it takes uh, free media, which we unfortunately don't have in Serbia and in parts of the region. And that's why um, we have the current situation where pro-Russian sentiments are quite, I would say, um, visible, quite uh, strong. Um, Serbia is traditionally friendly country with Russia. So we don't see really to what extent the Russian might is present in uh, in Serbia, unlike many other countries where actually most of the people and most of the public is against Russia. So you can trace and really see what they want to try, what they want to influence. Um, in our case, it's, it's a bit different. In our case, in case of um, a Serbian part of Bosnia, it's a bit more uh, difficult because, as I said, they operate in a friendly environment. Nice. That puts it quite well as to, for those who might be confused as to where this pro-Russian sentiment could come from. And this also leads into my next question, which is, so the region has had opposing forces of influence for a while, whether it was US against Russia or Europe against Russia. But recently there has been some doubts in the awareness of these dichotomies among EU decision makers. So in reference to Serbia's foreign policy and diplomacy, do you agree with the statement that the some EU decision makers might have overlooked its relation with Russia? Um, they definitely, um... Uh, did overlook it. I think that um, uh, they were taking it too much for granted that Serbia is on the uh, the European path and 
that things will not change. Uh, I mean, for me, uh, um, it was evident that this is not honest um, attitude by the Serbian authorities because I have seen what that approach uh, was uh, was basically uh, implemented or practiced in, in the in the domestic politics and in domestic politics. We have seen everything but the European values which the government was standing for. We had seen, um, let's say, um, uh, attacks on the human rights activists. Ever since 2020, when we started monitoring this, we had more than 350 attacks on civil society activists. Then we had a situation when, where the journalists were arrested during the state of emergency, which was introduced due to the COVID, uh, which we haven't seen since Milosevic times. So all this tells us that, uh, I mean, uh, maybe nominally we are looking and we are going into the, uh, or we are going on the European path, but practically we are more clo closely looking to the authoritarian uh, and uh, autocratic systems uh, that we have, uh, unfortunately, in our uh, surrounding. It's a great update on the current situation. And then my final question is, the Western Balkans does have deep-rooted cross-border communities, which have often caused disruptions in the region. In particular, I'm going to mention notions or those people who support the notions of a greater Serbia or a greater Albania. And uh, so, in your opinion, how can stability in the region be obtained despite these cross-border ties? And if there was a solution to overcome these notions that are still present in the region? I think the only way how we can really uh, overcome uh, the, these nationalistic narratives and, and um, and um, let's say historical dreams of the nationalism of certain nations is to really to nurture democratic stability in the region. Uh, uh, and that means that we not have a stabilitocracy, but to have democratic stability and democratic forces, not only within the nation states or the nations or the countries in the region, but also on the regional level, we have to have uh, sufficient democratic forces in the region uh, on the regional level when uh, there is the where uh, we don't have enough democratic forces within one country uh, these um, democratic forces on the regional level can really uh, in a way um, spill over and really uh, take back the de democracy from from nationalists uh, I think uh, what we have seen so far is that um, EU was paying attention to many things in the region, but not really so much on the on, on democratic on democratical structures, on democracy itself, and really, um, you know, usually, and what we know from the history, there are no quick fixes in 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 the region, in the Balkans in general. We have to work towards creating sustainable democratic societies here, and this takes some time. So we have to be patient and really with the, with, with the right goal. So we cannot just come and go, and once it's bad, we come and fix it. That's perfect, and it's a good reminder on how patience is a virtue. So thank you for all your answers today, and I hope... Um, this leads to more progressive dialogue on the matter and on stability in the region. So thank Me you too. once again for joining us today. You're welcome.